In life, there's some things you can learn from books. Others, you have to have on the job training. And in my first year as a market maker and pro trader, I learned four critical lessons that have always stuck with me and changed how I approach the markets. In today's video, we're gonna discuss those four lessons as I break down my first year as a market maker and pro trader. Let's get started. So it's the summer of 2007. My then girlfriend, now wife, is working at the bank and she just happens, her department just happens to be next to the market making department. Now, uh, I remember her coming up to me and saying like, you know, hey Matt, they're, they're looking to hire people. They haven't hired any, anyone in a while and, and they're opening it up to kind of bring people on. You'll be graduating university soon. Why don't you apply? So, you know, I was really excited by the idea. At that point, I was kind of, you know, everyone makes fun of like the Robin Hood traders now, but I guess that's kind of what I was pre Robin Hood. I mean, I was, you know, teenager, early twenties, just trading off my laptop, anything that, that was moving quickly and learning all the lessons that come with it. But you know, I, I'd done well, it already been a few years I was trading. I said, oh, this is really gonna be my, my chance, my, my shot to kind of show that I know what I'm doing. So I went for the interview, I ended up getting offered the job and I was offered the job in November, 2007. And I began trading on the first trading day of 2008. Now that was summer of 07, got the job in November 07 and started trading in January 08. Take a look at the chart of the S&P 500 and those dates. That was not a good time to start a trading career. That was right at the beginning of the financial crisis. So I, there's a lot to learn in the first year uh, doing that. So I show up to the office on my first day of work and I'm expecting some kind of training. I just figure, you know, we're starting on a trading desk. They must have some kind of process or some kind of special magic that they're gonna, they're gonna show me that how to make all this big money, right? So I get to the first day and I still remember sitting down at my desk and I get kind of a, pretty much just like um, a few key notes of how to work the order entry system. So this was all keyboard driven. There was no mouse clicking. And so like F1 was buy, F4 was sell, and F3 was short, go make us some money. And so this was not at all what I was expecting. Um, and interesting at the time, I was really deep into technical analysis. I mean, I, I still use charts all the time, but I was totally a technical driven trader pretty much at that point. And I had all these fancy tools and indica indicators I'd built and you know, I was in a swing trade this way and that way. And I remember getting there and my charting software, for whatever reason, this is you know, 2007, couldn't like, connect to the data provider through the firewalls of, of the bank. And I remember being on the phone and I'm like a young guy and there's like IT people coming all, all to try and get my software to connect and we can't get it to work. So, you know, here I am, I have, have this plan in place and suddenly I, I can't use any of the indicators I've, I've had to rely on. So I was sitting next to, you know, during this time, uh, Franco, who, who, you know, with time kind of mentored me and showed me a lot of the tricks of the trade. And he really opened my, my eyes up to a different way of reacting to the market. So he was from the floor. He was all about day trading and putting on all these, these positions and reacting to the market flow. And so I remember it was one of the first days, I think it was the second or third day, uh, I was sitting next to him and he says, okay, your stuff's not working, let's look at my charts. He's like, so take a look at this stock. And I forget what stock it was, but he says, what would you do here? I says, well, you know, I would be buying at this level because look at this support and you know, we're gonna find support and we're gonna run from there, it's, it's, it's a sure trade. He's like, oh really, eh? So I remember bring, I see him bring up his keyboard and bang, he sells a block of stock of this symbol and the stock breaks that support level. He's like, well, there's your support level. It didn't help you anymore. And I was like, what is this? Like up until that point, I had only, again, studied what was in the books, right? Technical analysis, fundamental analysis. I, I did my undergraduate in, in economics. And like what he just did, like was not in any of the manuals. Like, well, you're not supposed to be able to kind of influence or break the chart. It's kind of like, we study markets in a way where like, as if we're not a part of what's going on. But when you start to trade size and you start to have, you know, an impact, suddenly you realize, hey, these charts and, you know, this data is part of the story. I, I kind of, that just suddenly, sh like kind of shockingly opened my eyes to, there's this whole other element. There's the actual market analysis that you're doing about it. It's, it's all about understanding how are these buyers and sellers really coming together? That's the, the flow. That's what you're trying to really get from the stock charts. And that really helped me kind of change the way I look at and interpret technical analysis. I mean, head and shoulders and all this stuff, and, and I got all the theory. I was already doing my CMT designation, which is, you know, uh, you know it's kind of like the, the CFA for fundamental analysis, CMT is for technical analysis. And I had already completed that. And this like one instance kind of threw all of, all of that out the window. I mean, like the, the analysis was valid, but the way I looked at why these patterns were important, why these oscillators worked, suddenly was dramatically different. So I, I learned an incredibly important first point of how to look at the market different, try and understand really what is going on 
and get past the fact that you're looking at a pattern or a fundamental data point. Try and understand why this story is developing this way. So number two, like I mentioned, because my software wasn't working and, and we didn't end up getting it to work. So, you know, spending a few days with Franco, kind of looking at what he does and, and he was day trading. Everybody was day trading on the desk because again, these were guys from the floor. So the you know, swing trading was secondary. Some guys would build up positions, but the focus was to kind of just really roll over the capital. And so I began day trading uh, and I'd never day trading. I tried a few times, but it was never really what I focused on. Up until that point, I'd done a lot of swing trading with like futures, currencies. I did growth investing, having read William O'Neill's book, How to Make Money in Stocks. But day trading was never, I mean, I was in school. I didn't really have the opportunity to day trade. So I had to do whatever I could outside of uh, like my, my studying hours. And so I had to suddenly kind of sit there and rebuild a strategy for what was essentially, I mean, I, was, I wasn't told to have to strictly day trade, but it was kind of impressed upon me that that's what I'm supposed to be doing here, which, you know, would, would have been good to know before I started. Um, so I had to kind of rebuild the strategy for my new goal. And I, I did, I got it done. And, and ultimately, even my first year, I was profitable my first year. I think it was after month three or four, I started to kind of make regular profits. Uh, but basically, I had to take all the knowledge I had at that point, all the technical analysis, like, you know, kind of sitting next to Franco, seeing how he puts his orders in and out and, and how he builds up his positions and gets rid of them. And I started to kind of build together a strategy that I would implement every day. And bit by bit, I realized, hey, look, I mean, you can pretty much achieve any goal you want. Again, just like I kind of, you know, um, naively thought originally that this technical analysis, fundamental analysis was kind of existed outside of what the market as if it wasn't a part of it itself. Well, I kind of realized as well, these strategies that we learn, every strategy can be a manipulator. Every strategy is just a variation of how someone is trying to reach their goal within their stated preference. I mean, I was allowed you know, to keep so much risk overnight. I was, you know, they want me to kind of make money every single day. Uh, there was the, you know, we were focused on Canadian stocks because we were in Canada. And so I had to kind of readjust my strategy to kind of reach these goals. And I did. And so that kind of, again, light bulb moment, hey, you can pretty much turn investing into whatever you want it to be. If you're looking for, you know, three, four baggers on these growth stocks and you want limited risk and you want to build, you, you, that's one way you can do it. If you want to swing trade, that's something else. If you want to day trade, that's something else. If you want to do some kind of spread arbitrage, there's so many ways you can make money. And, and I was obsessed with markets from when I first discovered them. So I ended up trying everything, spoke to every guy on the desk. Oh, you're doing ARB. Okay. You're doing um, spread trading. Okay. You're doing uh, mer uh, merger takeover, whatever anybody did. I had to try it out because I wanted to see what it was about. Try and understand the logic behind the strategies from, you know, guys who, who were willing to share. And so that was really another, a second kind of transformative point that I learned on the desk that anything can be achieved and you have to just kind of sit down like any business and write out your plan, write out what are your tools, why am I using these tools, why am I running this process, and how can I reach my end goal? The third big lesson I learned was all about risk management. Now, like I showed that first chart at the beginning of the video, I started in 2008. I mean, this is, that was the worst crash the economy had suffered in decades. Sure, there was the dot-com blow up, but if you look at the S&P, I mean, 2008 was a really bad year. And especially, like I said, trading in Canada, oil topped, I mean, there were, dramatic drops across the board. And I'll be honest, even to this day, I don't really like short selling. It's just the way my mind works. I've, I've always been kind of bullish biased and some people are short biased, but I, I was able to kind of make money that year. I, I had a, a decent year for a first year, I think uh, day trading in the financial crisis. Um, and I did it all from the long side. And, and what really helped was just having those core risk management protocols that that management put on us. So basically it was really simple. They just limited how much risk you had outstanding overnight. And they really stared closely at kind of your daily losses and your, your monthly losses. And of course your year to date losses, if you had any. So like those really simple metrics and you can make risk management really complicated, same with portfolio management. But I learned that risk management number one is critical in surviving bad markets. Cause again, when I kind of joined, it was up until that point, Wall Street were like the titans of the world. I mean, masters of the universe came from that, from that era where, you know, these people were making all this money and these institutions were huge and you suddenly saw them crumbling before your eyes. And so like risk management was really a massive learning experience. What wasn't kind of um, important to me starting out because you're younger, you just want to make money. Suddenly I realized like, hey, if you want to survive in this business, you need a good risk management plan. And equally, it can be super simple. As long as you cover the core of where you can get hurt for your strategy, you're going to be fine. So for example, because you're day trading, if, 
if you limit your overnight, your overnight risk and you watch how much you lose in a single day, you can never really get blown up. Those, those two metrics limit your ability to blow yourself up, you know? So uh, same with, if you look at month to day losses, if you want to make sure, okay, even if I don't have one bad day, but I'm have like a serious, every day is a loser. Let's just say you, you don't want to be in that situation. Well, the month, the monthly statistic will pick that up. So just identifying what are the key criteria that, that represent the, the main risk to your strategy. Now, again, remember, like I mentioned with point number two, your strategy can be anything if you want it to be. So you have to sit down and like a, like a business person say, what are the main risks of my business of how I'm approaching this market? If you're, you know, doing, um, if you're, you're trading takeovers, you know, the risk is once the takeover is announced, it can be rescinded and the stock will, will plummet back down. So you need to factor in every major risk specific to your approach, but keep it simple. Keep risk management top of mind, but keep it simple. And so that was really, really uh, another powerful lesson that I learned. Now, the fourth lesson that I learned, I think is maybe the most important lesson that I learned that year. So I remember it was December, 2008. We had kind of like one of the worst parts of the financial crisis was like October, November. But in December, a lot of the banks were starting to raise capital. So I remember the bank I was at, uh, it was one night. I remember it was, it was I think, about five o'clock. It was already dark outside because it was December and it gets dark early. So it's kind of gloomy. Markets are terrible. It was another day where the markets were down really big. And I remember news hits the wire that our bank was doing an equity raise. They were selling stock to raise capital to kind of protect the bank against all of this financial crisis stuff going on. And I remember it was just myself and my boss left on the desk. Everyone had already gone home. And I just remember him kind of like slumped over saying like, oh my goodness, I, I can't believe they're selling stock at these prices. I mean, the company had come down significantly from its heights. And I just remember like, I'm a young guy, I'm like 22. It's like, hey, you know, like we're gonna make a ton of money. And then suddenly you're, you're looking in at all of these banks that again, were the masters of the universe. and your manager who has all this experience looking so kind of concerned and you're just wondering to yourself like, wait a second, like is the bank I'm working for gonna be here? Like maybe I'm, I'm you know, learning the ropes, I'm doing great, but now suddenly this new career I'm just starting, is it already over? So like I remember coming into work the next day and kind of talking this through with, with Franco again, you know, and, and, and he, he was interesting. I was the youngest guy on the desk, he was the oldest guy on the desk. So he had a lot of experience. And he's like, Matt, I have this great story for you that I, I heard years ago. And so this is something he heard when he was on the floor. And uh, this story kind of changed the way I look at everything for markets and even in life in general. It's, it's, it's the mindset of a trader. How does a trader think? If you spend enough time with traders, you'll notice they have a similar way of approaching problems. And it's kind of unique from what most people will, will, will do. So the story was basically it was 1962 and uh, there was an embargo on Cuba by the United States. It was a cold war and um, the USSR had placed nuclear missiles in Cuba. So the US had an embargo on Cuba and there was this, US, this Soviet ship was, which was heading towards this, this Navy embargo and everyone was worried, oh my God, this is gonna be like World War III, we're all finished, you know, the world's gonna end, we're gonna have nuclear war between the two superpowers of the time. And stocks are falling and this one trader, this is the, the rumors, he gets in there and he starts buying all of the stock. So people around them are saying like, what are you crazy? We're about to go into World War III. I mean, like oof, there may not even be an exchange tomorrow. Like, what are you doing? Why are you buying the stock? I mean, why are you levering up? Why are you, why are you putting all these positions? He says, well, look guys, one of two things are gonna happen. We're gonna either have a nuclear war and we're all gonna die, which I don't need my money anyways, or the war is gonna be averted and stocks are gonna take off because the, the worry about war is gone and I'll make a fortune. Either way, I might as well buy stocks because the alternative is, Everything's going to end and I won't need the money anyways. And, you know, he ended up being right if this, this urban legend is true or not. Um, the crisis was averted. The, the Soviet ship sailed away and uh, the uh, missile crisis in Cuba ended and stocks just took off. In fact, William O'Neill in 1962 uh, caught his first major winner, which was Chrysler, which came off of that bottom in 62. So that kind of, I, was, I, I, I remember sitting there saying like, oh, I, just, I wouldn't have thought about it that way. And again, the viewpoint of a trader is you're always looking at everything in terms of probability, in terms of risk versus reward. And that's really different from how most people will address most problems. People want to win. People want to be right. In trading, you don't have to be right. I mean, this, look at this guy here. He says, look, I may be right, I may be wrong. I got a coin flip. I don't know if there'll be a nuclear Armageddon in, in, in a couple of days. 
All I know is if there is Armageddon, well, you know, the losses are there anyways, but if things go well, I can make a fortune. And so that really changed the way I look at every situation. Suddenly, you know, there's like, you know, the old saying is you buy on the rumor, you sell on the news. I remember like, how does that work? I mean, why is someone buying the rumor? Then when the news comes out, it's confirmed. Shouldn't the stock go higher? That's not the way it works. People are already loading up way in advance of this good announcement. And once the announcement comes out, there's nothing new that, that anything good else that can come out for the stock. So the experienced traders sell the stock because everything that's good has happened. Similar with like that, that example we talk, spoke about in 1962, everything that, that could be bad has already happened. So we can only move up from here. So that really shifted the way I approach life and especially trading specifically was learning how to look at things through the lens of a trader. And that mindset is really unique. There's not many occupations that require that kind of mindset. It's really a strategic kind of game theory type of mindset. And again, most people think about being right. If you're at a job, your boss wants you to, 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 you know, to do what you're supposed to do. You know, he wants you to service the client. He wants things to be done well. He doesn't want you like estimating odds and probability and like, ah, oh, you know, boss, uh, you know, two to one. I thought, no, 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 go out there and just succeed. I don't want failure. I want you to get the job done and come home and that's it. Well, with trading, that doesn't work. It's not about being right. You can be wrong way more often than you're right. But if when you're right, you win big, you can still do very well. Again, it's all specific to your own strategy, but looking at it through the lens of not being right or wrong, but looking at it through the lens of risk versus reward, probability, payoffs uh, versus cost, totally transform the way I, um, I, I look at the world and I look, I look at markets. So that, that year was so transformative. It, it changed the way I look at tools. It changed the way uh, I, I look at charts. It changed the way I, I think. It did so many good things. And what, you know, in hindsight, you could kind of have been a bit of a pessimist saying like, oh, this is my first year and look at these awful markets I'm given. In hindsight, it was amazing. It gave me this amazing opportunity to learn in it's a terrible environment, but ultimately gave me all these great lessons. If you're making money in the market, you're probably not learning and improving yourself. You're still kind of just, you're so happy to be making money that you're, you're looking past the fact that, you know, maybe you're making mistakes. The mistakes will show themselves in, in a poor environment. So, you know, being an optimist, you know, looking at a situation. And again, even that, that example of 1962, it's easy to fall pray to pessimism and worry and concern because there's always things that can go wrong, things that do go wrong. It's about kind of making the best out of every situation and, and, and stepping forward and, and constantly improving your process and iterating yourself and watching your risk along the way and becoming a better trader. And those four lessons I learned that year really rounded me out as a trader and helped me to kind of consistently perform and be a great trader at my firm and, and just it helped me to, to do what I love and just trade for a living. I remember like, you know, at the depths of that 2008, that was a question to myself. I said, I love trading so much. It's all I ever wanted to do. I said, now what is it going to be thrown away because of um, this financial crisis? And it wasn't. And also the lessons I learned helped me to be adept enough to kind of make money and survive any kind of environment because they were foundational, critical lessons that you can't learn in books. And I've read my fair share. This is just a small, a very small sample of the books I got. Uh, my wife keeps getting upset at me every time I order books. Like we have nowhere else to put them. But to me, you know, books are knowledge, but there's some things you really just have to learn on the job. So I hope these lessons kind of illuminated some, some ideas you hadn't thought of. And I would also say, you know, don't get down if things are not working well at least try and pull the key lesson out of them that will help you not make those mistakes again and will help you to kind of become a better trader each time. And slowly over time, you'll become better at your craft. And next thing you know, you'll be regularly profitable and you'll be able to kind of adapt to any market environment. If you got a lot of value out of this video, please like, subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter at trader underscore mcaruso. You can come to my website, carusoinsights.com. I got a lot of stuff there, including education and a whole lot more. Um, we'll be back to a new videos. Talk to you soon. Thanks.